Chapter 3 Social, Moral, and Emotional Development Our organizing questions for this chapter are, what's the different views of social, emotional, and moral, moral development? What are the stages that children go through for social and emotional development? And then how can we use these different theories about social and emotional development and moral development to help solve classroom problems in classroom management, or even behavior problems for parents? So some of the views on personal and social um, development, as children improve their cognitive skills, so as their cognitive skills increase, as we talked about with um, Vygotsky and Piaget, they're also developing, starting to develop their self-concept, ways with, it, with which they interact with others and their attitudes towards the world. Understanding personal and social development is a critical, um, allows you to motivate, teach, and successfully interact with students at their various ages. Once you understand what they're going through socially and emotionally, it helps you kind of tap in to where they're at. The first person that looked at this was Eric Erickson, and he came up with his eight stages of psychosocial development. Erickson was actually a student of Piaget's. So he took Piaget's cognitive development and then applied them to children's social and emotional development. So he hypothesized that people pass through eight psychosocial stages without, during their lifetime. At each stage, they have a crisis or a critical issue which has to be resolved. If you don't resolve that critical issue, then you're going to kind of carry remnants of it throughout your life. So most people resolve those psychosocial crises or crisis satisfactory. And so they're able to put it behind them and then they move on to new challenges. But some people do not completely resolve them and they must continue to deal with them later in life. So stage one, trust versus mis mistrust. And that's birth to age 18 months. And the goal of an infant is really to build trust in the world. So you as a parent have to be there for them. When they cry, you have to feed them or have to change their diaper. They're looking for this relationship building that goes along because this is social. To be social is to interact with one another. So he des describes this as the basic trust, is the essential truthfulness of others. So how truthful is this society that we live in to take care of you? And then also your fundamental self of your self sense of your own self-worth or your trustworthiness. So they're looking at um, the relationship between the primary caregiver and the child to be a positive one. If they don't have that, then they're not going to trust as they grow older. You ever hear about children who, um, adopted children and stuff who um, have separation anxiety or they have, um, uh, what do they call it? Um, well, it's a dissociative um, disorder, but they can't really build a good bond with um, their new adoptive parent because one of the reasons is, is that they didn't learn this idea of being able to trust others. Stage two is autonomy versus doubt. And um, Erickson believed that children at this stage have this dual desire to hold and let go. Parents who are flexible give their kid permission to explore things, do it for themselves. Um, but then also being there to make sure that they don't go crazy and it's not too much freedom. Um, they, the children in the, that age develop a sense of autonomy. I call this the me-do stage where they want to do everything themselves. They want to dress themselves. My children would, my daughter would put on her pants backwards or shoes on the wrong feet. And when I tell her they're on the room, she'd say, no, mommy, they're fine. And she'd walk even though she was like her feet were hurting her, she'd be walking in them because she did it herself. It was a me-do stage. Also in autonomy versus self-doubt, that whole idea of holding and let go. Children at this time are typically potty training. And so oftentimes you'll hear of children when they're potty training will do something like um, they'll be completely potty trained and then all of a sudden they'll decide to just pee on the floor. Because it's the first time in their life that they've actually had control over something. You know, they don't have control over their food. They don't have control what they eat. They don't have control over what time they eat. They don't usually have control even of what they're wearing or how they're dressing. So we're just starting to do this. The thing that they have complete control over um, is bowel movements. So uh, you'll have kids that will, f you kind of use that and they'll say like, my. Um, great nephew right now is to, he's perfectly capable of being potty trained and his mom will say do you want to potty train he'll say no no I don't think so um, so it's the first time in their life that they actually have some kind of a, a control and they really like to hold on to that or else they can let go and you got to kind of just let them go don't force them because all you're going to do is um, create doubt stage three is initiative versus guilt 
And during this time, kids are starting to mature motor skills. Their gross and fine motor skills are maturing. Their language skills are um, maturing. Um, they start to explore socially their physical environment. They're running, they're jumping, they're playing, they're learning t to do sports. Um, they're being able to socialize with other children. They're no longer doing parallel play um, and solitary play. They're starting to play with other children. They're learning how to do games. So parents who permit children to run and jump and play and slide and throw and encourage that sense of initiative that they go out there and get out there and they fail and they get up and they brush themselves off and do it again, they will develop initiative, that, this whole idea that they, they can do things. But parents who severely um, punish their kids um, anytime that they do any kind of initiative and they yell at them and tell them they're not good at something or that they made a mess or whatever, that will make children feel guilty. And so they'll have guilt. Um, and that can later affect you because you don't ever think you're going to do anything right. Uh, stage four, which is industry versus inferiority. Um, that's when you get into school. If you look at that, that's pretty much um, early school years from kindergarten to um, about sixth grade. So it's a huge expansion of the child's social world. They're, they're starting to get best friends and they're having all these friends. Um, and some success in schools. You know, they're learning to read. They're learning to write. They're learning to do mathematics. Um, so they have this the sense of industry that that what they do that they're making contributions to society um, they start to get this good feeling about yourself or your or your ability however if you fail or you don't do well in those early grades um, then you start to develop an inferiority complex like you don't think you're the best reader or you're not very good at this um, and failure creates that negative self-image and a sense of inadequacy that may hinder yourself in future learning. Like some of you may be like thinking, I'm not a good reader, just because like in kindergarten, you weren't reading the same as the kid next to you. Um, and so you got to get over that kind of stuff and being able to talk about that. That's why it's good to make sure that kids um, are successful. If we have kids, a lot of times kids will act out in school or act out at home because they have a fear of failure. They'd rather be the class clown than be thought of as a child who doesn't know how to do math. So they'd rather act out than be thought of as stupid. And that goes into that whole idea of industry versus inferiority. Erickson's stage five is identity versus role confusion. This is your adolescent years. We try to experiment with like how you look, what you do. Um, a lot of times like I dyed my hair dark brown and started wearing face makeup all the time in like 10th and 11th grade. And, um, and you guys probably haven't seen me if you saw my picture. I'm not a dark brown, I have blondish hair. And um, the real reason is they're trying to kind of pull away from your parents. You start to develop your own ideas a lot of times about um, your, maybe your political party. Um, and kids will go through these stages. By my senior year, I was a granola girl. My hair was back to its natural color. I didn't wear any makeup at all. And I became a vegetarian. Um, so you kind of like play with these different identities to see who you really want to be and who you're becoming. Um, also during this time, a lot of times kids will... Um, start to really examine their sexuality or their gender orientation so they'll also a lot of times children who are transgender or who are um, homosexual will sometimes that will be the time when they start to really identify and think that yeah this is really who i am now if you don't um, resolve that then that can play out later on in your life so it's that whole idea of who, my, what's my identity and then the idea that I'm still kind of confused, I really don't know who I am. Stage six is intimacy versus isolation. And you're really kind of stage five is setting the stage for stage six. Uh, because once you find out who you are, then you know that you can share yourself with another person. That you can set your stage for this is who I'm going to be later on in my life. Um, young adults, you're kind of ready to form this new relationship of trust and int intimacy with another person because you kind of know who you are and you're trying to be exploring of who you guys could be as a couple. Um, and so that's young adulthood. And so it would really be anywhere from 18. Most men, they say, mature about age 30 and women mature about age 25. So this could well go into your 30s. And there are people with identity and role confusion that go into their 20s, especially if you had overly um, uh, oppressive parents in your earlier um, stage where you didn't really get to go through role confusion. And then they break away from their parents and then they start going through that identity and becoming uh, the person they are. You probably have seen this in college where you had somebody that came across and they were really goody two shoes in high school or something like that and they got to college and they completely broke bad. 
um, and they started to do things that you're like, whoa, who is this person? It's because they kind of had that delayed um, identity awareness that went, um, that usually happens earlier um, in your development. Stage seven is generativity versus self-absorption. That's your middle adulthood. And that's this idea that you're establishing the next generation. This is usually when parents are parenting. Um, it's their job to make sure that their children um, become good adults. Uh, typically, you attain that generativity to raising your own kids. However, some people don't have children. So in this stage, it would um, be through other forms like productivity, creativity. Um, you might be... Uh, you know, at the top of your game in advertising. You could make it to the major leagues in sports. You could be the best violinist in the country um, or whatever you're going to be. Um, you know, whatever you're, that you're making it out there, that you're contributing to society and that you're, um, you're giving back. Now, the idea of self-absorption would be someone, though, that hasn't reached that stage yet and they're still pretty much stuck either back in the um, self-identity or else it's all about me it's that me person that they're not really worrying about anyone else it's all about me it might be you know the guy who's cutting throats and you know up the corporate ladder or ripping off other people you know just to make a buck because it's a whole idea that it's all about me and it's self-absorption um, stage eight is integrity versus despair, and that's your late adulthood. And those are your final stages of the psychosocial development. And people who ba look back in their life and have, have resolved all their um, stages, they usually have a pretty good acceptance um, they, of their accomplishments, even their failures and the limitations that um, they brought. But it's this tense of integrity, of wholeness. Um, and that I'm responsible for where I am in life. And you can see how somebody would have integrity and then somebody could possibly have despair. Because if you look back in your life and you didn't do a good job raising your kids or, you know, you, you didn't make really anything of your life, then you start to just feel bad about it and you kind of are like an angry old person um, and, and have a lot of, of sadness and despair. If you look back in your life and you, you see that you've done well and your children are doing well and you've you've you know raised good a good family then you look back and you have this integrity you look back and you think yeah this is it I've you know I've done it um, I, I always tell the story that I think about my dad um, he was actually dying he was almost um, he was in the hospital and he looked it back at my mom and all of us were around the um, in the hospital room and he looked at my mom and he got tears in his eyes and he said we did good babe um, and, you know, he had been a successful businessman and he had done well and his family had all done well. And, and I thought, I'm so happy because he has integrity. You know, he's going to die with this sense of accomplishment. Um, and, and that's pretty much what P um, Erickson would say that you want to do. <clears throat> There's a pretty good ditty if you want to look at it. It's on YouTube. Um, Google Eric Erickson's Hoedown. It kind of gives you a... Um, pretty funny little uh, musical uh, rendition of the, um, the stages of Erickson's psychosocial stages. Uh, I won't play it for you because you're probably got more time to do than something else. So we're going to look at moral development. So uh, Erickson looked at psychosocial development and then Piaget um, started to look a little bit at moral development. Piaget and Kohlberg were the two people that mostly have looked at moral development and both of them thought that um, morality has to do with intellectual ability or your cognitive ability. So the more cognitive, um, the higher you up on the cognitive level, the more um, able you are to morally abstract or make moral decisions. So Piaget's um, theory of cognitive development development includes a theory about the development of moral reasoning. So you have to be able to reason. So if you really think about that, considering children really can't do any kind of reasoning until they're really kind of at concrete operational level with, you know, like I'm talking about purposeful reasoning, um, then you're going to look at kids be below that age are going to have a difficult time with it. Children believe that cognitive, I mean, Piaget believe that cognitive structures and abilities um, develop first. So you have to develop your cognitive ability um, and thinking abilities before you can develop moral abilities or, or moral thinking. Cognitive abilities then determine the children's ability to reason about social situations. 
Um, as with cognitive abilities, Piaget provo proposed moral developments that progress in a predictable stage. Now, um, some of the implications and criticisms of Erickson's theory, so he um, went into some of his theories that he talked about. Uh, and like I said, Piaget and Erickson worked together. And so he thought about, um, he was using Piaget's cognitive theories when he thought about this. And he said, but so he was kind of making it go through step by step by step the same way Piaget would. And some of the people talk about this and they say not all people experience Erickson's crises at the same time um, and to the same degree. So <clears throat> does that mean that some children or people, you know, what makes the degree, what makes you pass through that stage? And some people have to have passed through it much, you know, with much more crises than others. Um, and then they also said that it didn't happen at the same time. And then there were some people that, if you look at it from a mor mor morality um, instance, you know that some people will regress. So why is it that if you've passed that crisis, why wouldn't your morality follow along with it? And the age ranges presented may present uh, may represent the best times for the crisis to be resolved, but that's not always possible. You know, sometimes people can't do that. You know, if you don't get into a relationship with somebody until your mid thirties, you're still not you haven't passed through intimacy. And sometimes people have, you know, children earlier. So you have to have generativity when you're parenting before you've um, maybe gotten into a real serious relationship with another person. Erickson's theory described the basic issues that people confront as they go through life. However, his theory has been criticized because it does not explain how or why they progress from one stage to another. And they're kind of difficult um, to confirm through research. Even though most people who talk to them and listen to them and you, you know, study them, you would say, yeah, that makes sense. But they're kind of hard to research. So when we look at this um, and we go back to Piaget's moral development, uh, you have to say society can't function. What is morality? You know, like what does society and your social ability have to do with morality? Well, society can't function without rules that tell people how to communicate with one another. So you have to go through your social stages or social emotional stages, but you have to have a moral compass from which to do that. And then just as children differ um, from adults in cognitive and personal development, they also differ in moral reasoning. So Piaget's um, theory of cog cognitive development, um, he talks about... Um, I think this is the same slide. So if we look at Piaget's stages of moral development, he talks about heteronominous um, morality and autonomous morality. And from ages about five to nine to 10 years old, and notice that that would be during like more of the concrete operational stages, um, and notice he doesn't do anything before five because morality before five is, is pretty much non-existent. It's, they would say that they're almost hedonistic. It's um, children from birth to age four are really trying to um, just meet their basic needs. Uh, so when they talk about kids thinking about what they're doing, um, he talks about from five to nine and a half or nine to 10, it's associated with moral re realism or absolutism. Moral knowledge and understanding are objective and absolute. So when you're talking to a five-year-old, there are laws, rules, punishment, and right and wrong. And they emanate from external sources like God or adults. Um, and obedience is just good in itself. Um, you have your external re responsibility, which is about amount of damage, like how much trouble am I going to get in? And then you have your expiatory um, punishment, the degree of authority or imminent justice. It's decreed by authority. So there's this like justice, the eminent justice that somebody's watching over you. When I think about my son when he's about five, I'll give you an example that um, he started, when he was about three or two, no, it must've been about two, he would drink chocolate milk and he stopped eating food. So the pediatrician told us not to give him um, milk anymore. And that he could only have one um, glass of milk a day. And so we told him that it was a rule that you could only have chocolate milk in the morning. And he would literally throw himself um, on the refrigerator and scream for gawk, which is chocolate milk. And, um, and then it got to be the point where, you know, like chocolate milk was only in the morning. And when he went to kindergarten, he was about five. Um, 
he knew that you should only have chocolate milk in the morning because that was a rule. But he started to break the rule because they had chocolate milk at lunch. And about, I don't know, maybe about six months after he was going to school, he came home and he was just like riddled with guilt. And he looked at me and he said, Mommy. And I said, what? He, and I go, what? And he goes, Mommy, I, I don't know what to tell you. And I said, what? He goes, I have been very bad. And I said, why? And he said, because at school they don't know about the rule. And I said, what rule? And he said, I've been having chocolate milk every day for lunch. And I mean, he was just like whispering it. And he was just so worried because he was waiting. I could just see him every day waiting for the damage to come, like waiting for the ax to fall. Because every day he was, you know, he was breaking the rule of eating, drinking chocolate milk at lunch. So when you get a little bit older, um, you get to be the autonomous morality. And that's kind of with moral um, relativism. And morality is not a matter of obeying authorities, but it's rather it grows out of the human relationships, how we respect people's differing point of views. You know, you do it because it's right or it's wrong, or you just don't think that that's good for another person or good for society. And it's really an internal responsibility, and its tensions are um, behind how much, like not causing... Um, something bad to happen within society um, and it's re reciprocity a lot of times too like how will this come back to me how will this hurt um, our environment or how will this hurt our society um, and it's much reduced um, in the belief of imminent justice so it's not more about like whether it's against the law but whether it's right or wrong or whether you can um, justify it within your own self so Kohlberg was probably the one that studied um, morality the most. 